Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's Rory again, and uh, here we are with another Command Modern Naval Air Operations stream. Uh, this morning, we're going to be finishing off um, what we started the other week. It's, we had a, a sort of a bit of a hiatus in between. Uh, I think that was for the anniversary of Pearl Harbor. But uh, this morning, we're going to continue on with um, Dawn of a New Era. So uh, we'll just quickly catch up on what happened last time. So, just one moment, I'll get myself sorted. So last time, uh, we were basically tasked with, uh, with monitoring the situation in the Black Sea region as the NATO forces. Uh, this morning at, it yeah, came time, <laughs> this morning at approximately 08.30, uh, Russian forces conducted deliberate and sustained attacks on NATO forces. Uh, that cost us a DDG, which was the USS The Sullivans, and uh, we've got one frigate that's currently dead in the water. Um, I believe that was a Bulgarian ship. Uh, there's seven combat aircraft that we've lost, six F-15s and one F-35. Um, multiple radar sites have been destroyed in the Black Sea area, and we've got ongoing air combat and a very heavy anti-ship missile threat in the Black Sea currently. We've uh, received authority to strike, strike back, and we're in the middle of getting that organized now. So as you can see here in, uh, in the Black Sea region, um, we initially had... Uh, We've still got these forces active now, except uh, the USS The Sullivans has, has been destroyed. It's currently sinking. And uh, BGS Verney, uh, a Bulgarian frigate, has, um, has been heavily damaged and is likely to sink in the next hour or two. Uh, HMS Duncan, also uh, just down here, is also currently... Um, it, they've got several uh, missiles inbound um, and they've expended a lot of their uh, SAM uh, surface to air missile um, defense assets so it's very likely they'll take some heavy damage too uh, down in the Mediterranean <coughs> excuse me down in the Mediterranean we've got uh, a American uh, DDG and SSGN uh, both of them have expended their uh, Tomahawk missile uh, loads and there's there's currently 200 uh, TLAMs over over Turkey here on en route to the um, to the operational area in Crimea. Uh, the first impact is ETA in about 45 minutes time at uh, 0955 Zulu. Um, the volley should be completed by about 10.30 um, according to the, the ETA for the missiles. Um, so we've upgraded the uh, the threat in our in our air zones. So zone one is still remains safe. Uh, zone two is now medium threat and zone three is high threat at the front line. Um, the forces, we'll go quickly through the forces just to so, sort of keep everyone up to date where everything is. Um, the voyages at uh, RAF Bryce Norton are still on the ground. Uh, the strike aircraft from RAF Fairford are en route currently to, um, to the operational uh, area and their ETAs are listed there. So probably about 45 minutes to, oh, sorry, an hour, and, an hour and 10 minutes each until they're uh, on station to start delivering ordnance. And there's an RC-135X uh, currently on station around the English Channel area, possibly over France, just uh, doing its thing. Uh, at Ramstein, or Ramstein, depending how you pronounce it, um, there is uh, four KC-10 extenders who are currently running a, um, an uh, air-to-air air refueling track over, over Germany and Czech, uh, the Czech Republic. Um, Aviano has their E3 sentries up. Their E3 sentries are currently uh, doing a airborne early warning, airborne early warning track over uh, over Romania. Uh, at uh, Besme Air Base, that's where we've taken our our losses from, uh, mainly with our air superiority aircraft. And I believe everything happened very quickly, but I believe these losses were to service to air missile attacks. Um, so we've lost six uh, F-15C Eagles, we're leaving six left, and uh, we've lost one. Uh, F-35 Lightning, leaving five left. There's also uh, some strata tankers there that are up uh, running air-to-air -air refueling circuits over um, over Romania area. Uh, the river joint from NSA Suda Bay is currently running a um, an alien track just uh, over the Mediterranean and Adriatic Sea. We've got F-16Cs and CJs running out of uh, Akinchi Air Base. They've just taken off and they're en route to the Black Sea to, um, to start doing some strike work in the um, in the Black Sea area. There's also uh, eight, 
eight F-16 CJ Block 50s that have just conducted strikes on SSV Tattletales. Um, those strikes on, I think, four ships um, have crippled the, uh, the Tattletales and, and they're looking to be dead in the water at the moment. The Wedge Tales out of Konya Airport are currently doing a track at uh, the northern border of uh, northern sea border of Turkey. I probably might uh, bring them back a little bit south so that, um, so that they're a bit further out of danger. So as, as we said before, there's uh, been some friendly losses, uh, seven aircraft, aircraft altogether, uh, one US DDG and another another Bulgarian frigate is in, in serious danger. It's the same with the uh, UK DDG that's got multiple missiles inbound. We've also had some like, radar installations around the Black Sea area taken out. Uh, our friendly forces uh, that are not under our control are the Ukrainians. Uh, they've been taking heavy losses and they're requesting air cover. Um, the enemy forces haven't changed significantly from our last briefing. There's still approximately 300 frontline aircraft um, of various types, a very large concentration of air defences and ground forces around Crimea. Um, and we've noticed uh, in, in the, the preceding sort of uh, couple of hours that the, the SAM threat there is particularly high. Um, there's some very high-end surface to missiles employed in the area. Enemy losses. Oh, that's a shame. That didn't come out very well. Um, enemy losses. The... Basically, the, the bulk of their losses have been MiG-29 Fulcrums and SU-24 fences uh, with, with a variety of other platforms there. But it, so far, it's all been aircraft that we've, um, that we've destroyed on the enemy side. Uh, must mention as well, these are not all our kills. These are Some of these are from Ukrainian air defences as well. So our mission's been updated from monitor the situation to now contest the airspace over Black Sea and Crimea. Um, the intention is to achieve air superiority and prevent Russia from... Uh, from Preventing Russian strike aircraft from engaging NATO forces, and as a secondary objective to help defend the Ukrainian forces, we also want to degrade the um, Russian military infrastructure in Crimea, particularly uh, by removing the long-range SAM threat. Okay, so there's a lot going on, <laughs> um, and as you can see from the message log, there there is a lot going on here. So I think, I think that's kind of brought us up to date on what's going on. You can see here there's about 200 TLAMs uh, headed in. So that should be interesting to see when they all strike in about 45 minutes game time. Uh, let's start time. I think that first pulse, yeah, that first pulse always takes a few... Uh, a few seconds before it starts kicking into real time in large scenarios like this. So TLAMs here, they're running at 500 knots. Uh, the distance there is 246, so let's say half an hour at that point. And then from that point, there's another 120 years. So it's about 45 minutes until they start landing. Um, <clears throat> this flight of F F-15 Cs here is under direct threat from these SAMs, and I don't think they're going to be able to do much good chasing this air these aircraft here. So I'm actually going to head them. Yeah, I might head them home actually. Um, I think uh, I think it's becoming a bit of a um, Bit of a standard now that at the start of the stream it takes me a little bit a little bit of time to wake up because it's just gone 10 past six here in uh, in melbourne where i live in the morning um so it takes a little bit of time to wake up properly but uh i might be a little bit clumsy in the first half hour or so of our of our stream so i'm gonna head these guys home uh given the fact that <laughs> All of these high-end SAMs are inbound. I'm not sure if they're all going to make it, but I think... I think that we will um, do better if we just head home. So I'm just going to quickly adjust the volume on... Uh, on everything so that we don't blow your ears out with um, with sound effects. That should be better. <laughs> I 
So is, someone's asking if I'm in scuba gear, is it is because the audio quality is bad or is there, is there something else I'm not aware of there? Yeah, those guys, uh, we, we kind of knew that they were in trouble. That's a shame. Okay, so these F twenty uh, F thirty five lightnings are headed home. Yeah, I've got them on full. So they're super cruising home. Wow, these Russian Zams are really good. Now this is a uh, this is HMS Duncan, which was the British or. Uh, <laughs> well, the UK um, DDG. So the scuba reference was to Melbourne flooding. So obviously someone knows about Australian news. Uh, yeah, Melbourne is... Uh, we had a bit of flash flooding. And frankly, it happens all the time. Um, so at least once or twice a year, we'll get flash flooding when we have a heavy downpour of rain. But uh, I live on a hill, so everything's good for me. Um, I just got stuck in traffic a few times over the last few days. But fortunately, I haven't got anywhere urgent to be. So... Getting stuck, stuck in traffic hasn't had too many consequences for me apart from just being boring. So yeah, uh, I think uh, HMS Duncan has expended pretty much all of their SAMs uh, in the last in the last sort of, uh, stream. I believe they had forty odd or forty eight odd uh, Aster fifteen uh, surface to air missiles to defend themselves with. They've got four left, so they are in big trouble. Um, how are we going for the uh, for the level of sound? Is that too loud for you guys for the um, for the sound effects? Uh, Taconis just asked if Melbourne is the Australian equivalent of Baton Rouge. I don't think so. Melbourne has a pretty temperate climate. Um, just that what, usually when it rains here, it doesn't rain for very long. It rains you know, reasonably often, but it doesn't rain for very long. Uh, when we do get a sustained downpour of rain, then yeah, everything floods. And when I say flood, I mean, you know, like uh, it, it's flash flooding. It's not. Uh, it's not sort of torrential downpour, and you know, swimming down the street. It just means that a couple of roads will get uh, will get surface water, and uh, there might be some you know some delays in traffic. But that's really it. There's no major flood damage done. Okay, so this is this is all happening here. There's, there's lots going on there. Um, we've got our strike aircraft inbound. Uh, I think I might just deal with the situation down here. These, these guys are still going to be an hour-ish um, before we need to start thinking about where they're going to be delivering their weapons from, whereas all of this stuff is going to be happening in the next few minutes. So let's take care of this first. Okay, so some, some survivors there. Two, two out of the six that are in the air. I think we are going to make a beeline for the Bosphorus and get get out of um, get out of the Black Sea. I think as much as uh, I would like to just you know do a clean sweep of the Black Sea and claim it as our own, it's it's uh, Russia's backyard. They've got a much much bigger fleet um, presence in the in the Black Sea than we do. And realistically, um, the four vessels that are remaining inside this uh, this operational area have really no chance of contesting it effectively. Um, so discretion is often the better part of valor. And I think uh, we'll be using our discretion here and getting getting to safety. So we've got our flight of Turkish uh, F-16s here. Now these guys are carrying slammers. The slammers aren't gonna be awfully effective against against this uh, this cluster of air defenses here not in isolation that is so i might actually wait until i'll keep these guys on station to make use of their tomahawk missiles uh, sorry of their um of their amrams in air defense 
And when the Tomahawk missile fly beneath them, that's when I'll launch the slammers. So I'll sort of uh, combine the, um, the missile strikes for saturation effect. Uh, someone asked you, is this the last stream of the year? Yes, this will be the last stream of the year. Um, I go back to work next week. So I've uh, been given a full-time contract and as things often happen in my industry, things changed again. So um, I'm going back to work next week. I thought I was gonna have another three weeks off, but I'm going back to work next week. So I won't be able to stream for about a month, um, but I will be back in the, the early new year, hopefully to do some more streaming. Okay, so we've got a air defense loadout here, a flight of four, some 16 AM rounds. These guys are gonna take over and be our surrogate uh, air cover for HMS Duncan. These guys are gonna head over here and do the same thing for our Turkish frigate. Hmm. Okay, they're on plot, of course, they're headed home, right. So these were the SSVs that we mentioned before. Um, so one, two, well, there's another one over here somewhere. Maybe it's sunk, oh no, there's three there. Yeah, so the three SSVs that we had uh, missions plotted for have all been attacked and uh, crippled. So I'm gonna, just gonna delete those missions. Uh, yeah, that one can get deleted. So I hesitated there because I didn't want to delete uh, the mission while the aircraft is still in flight because then they go uh, unassigned and they just uh, they'll just sort of orbit one area until I give them more information, uh, more orders. So while they're en route home, I'm just going to leave them assigned to that mission. I'll delete it later on. They're not going to be ready for six hours anyway. Okay, so we've got some harm strikers here, um, high-speed anti-radiation missiles. Pop them. How many are in that flight? Two, four harms. Four harms is not that many. So I'm thinking about following um, the strike in, the Tomahawk strike in with some uh, anti-radiation missile cover. I will definitely do that. But what I'm also going to do is uh, launch some Growlers, which are ECM aircraft, and I'm going to provide some jamming cover. Um, I was going to wait a little while, but I think that, you know, things have heated up to the point where we need to do this sooner rather than later uh, and get some ECM going. So I'll launch a flight of two of those, um, and we'll keep, keep three in reserve. Okay, lots and lots of weapons there. <clears throat> oh, this is good. This is good news. So more harm shooters. Uh, these guys got harms as well, but I, honestly, I don't like your chances of getting off uh, laser guided weapons without suffering some pretty horrendous casualties. Ah, and we do have ECM already airborne, okay. All right, so things have, I won't say they've settled down, but uh, there is less imminent action going on in the Black Sea region. Um, they're going to orbit there. They're going to orbit there. These guys are still headed out to sea. I don't really want that. I was going to have my forward, air, uh, forward line of um, air defense sort of running around here. But at the moment, I can really only contest the airspace down here effectively. So better to have less area under my control and contest it more effectively than be spread out really thinly across the whole area. Uh, 
So can you? Okay. Right, that's that mission. Okay. Uh, so someone's asked about the sounds that I use. <clears throat> no, I don't use um, I don't use CAG. Uh, I have used that in the past, and it, it is really good. But um, I that's not what I use. I just uh, basically replace the uh, the sounds in the sounds folder with my own uh, MP MP3 files or WAV files, whatever they are. I replace them. Um, there is a uh, a forum thread on the Matrix Games forum that has a link to that. Um, I'll update it after the stream to make sure that it's at the top um, of the list and you can download them from there. Um, then there should be instructions in there on how to implement them as well. Hi Neuhauser. Okay. So I think I'm going to rename... Oh wow, first of all, to find something less suicidal for this guy to do. This guy can just go on a track across the Turkish coast for the moment. How long is that going to keep him occupied for? An hour and two minutes. Okay, that'll give me some time to think about what I want to do with him. Uh, so this is a, a maritime patrol aircraft that uh, I initially had going all over the Black Sea. If, if, if they were to continue on that track now, it, it's essentially suicide. So um, I've just given them some, some different orders to follow along the Turkish coast there, where they can still give us some recon on intel of what's going on, but you know, hopefully we'll survive the trip and get home. So there's some, okay, patrol craft around here. I don't know what that is, 15 knots. Oh no. Okay, so I just said oh no because I thought that uh, this vessel had been hit. It looks like the uh, phalanx, the seaweeds, saved them at the last moment. The, um, it works, the <laughs> seaweeds works. They, um, they narrowly avoided getting hit by a missile there. And yeah, I think it's uh, it's time for you guys to uh, get out of there. I'm gonna keep the uh, submarine headed towards the Crimean coast. Um, I don't think they're really gonna be able to contribute too much considering that their time to be on station is one day, nine hours. But uh, we'll, we'll see, we'll see what happens. So the SSVs uh, hit, they're burning, they're flooding. We'll just let time take care of that. More vampires incoming. Okay, they're headed towards 922. Okay, yeah, where are they headed towards? I think Duncan is going to be lucky to get out of this. But that's what these F-16s are here for. So I'm just going to drag select using F-1 for an auto attack. And then turn off their... Uh, turn off their plotted course by pressing F-3 twice. I'm not sure where um, Newhouse just asked whether the uh, F-35s are from the 388 fighter wing. Let's have a look. Uh, if that is the rude rams, then that is correct. I know from um, making my own scenarios that order of battle research is the hardest part of, of making a, um, a realistic scenario. Um, it's not too bad for the US, because most NATO countries and the US publish their orders of battle fairly openly. Um, but for countries like China and Russia, it's incredibly hard to get detailed information about um, 
what aircraft, for example, are based to which squadrons and where they're where they're located. Um, so all about research. If I if I'm making a scenario and the scenario takes uh, let's say a hundred hours, probably about thirty to forty of those hours are going to be all about research. Um, and and it's not going to be that um, after those thirty or forty hours, I'm a hundred percent satisfied with it. It's more that I'm just like I can't dedicate any more time to this. I need to move on. Um, you could you could easily make a career out of doing all about research and just be constantly busy. In fact, I believe there's several companies that do that. We've got our compass call up here providing jamming support. Uh, we'll add to the ECM choir with our uh, growlers. Now, the way that jamming works in command and in real life um, is that it's, it's quite directional. Uh, with, with the jamming pod, most of the effect is going to be aligned forward of the, uh, of the aircraft. Um, and to a lesser extent, but probably more than the sides, the rear will also be, be um, quite effective. Off to the sides, however, of an aircraft that is jamming tends to be the area of least effect of a jammer. And that depends on platforms, but as a, as a general rule, that's the case. So for that reason, I've actually changed the orientation of the growlers so that they're headed directly towards the Crimean Peninsula. What I might do though, is I'll have them heading in to this point at cruise speed and then from here on they can go to loiter speed just so we don't get too close now the great thing about the the growler compared to for example the uh, compass call is that uh they can look after themselves <laughs> they've um they've got their own uh air defense weapons um they're, they're quite a capable platform to begin with being based on the f-18 um so you don't have to worry about them quite as much as a you know big old uh, EC-130 flying around there that's totally unarmed and pretty helpless if it gets into any trouble. However, it's not the same as having you know uh, a air loadout of a FA-18 that's specifically for um, anti-air warfare there. More missiles inbound, these guided weapons, 30. So these, these F-15s here, they have weapons on board, but considering their fuel state, I'm not really willing to commit them to, to any sort of uh, operations over here. Um, they're just going to get over there and go bingo and then be even more vulnerable than they already are. And there's only two of them, so probably best that they just get home and uh, rearm, refuel. This flight, on the other hand. I'm happy to commit them. Okay, they can start hitting this way intercept those inbound missiles. It looks like the bulk of our um, air defense for these vessels is now going to be provided by offboard assets, seeing as they've essentially expended their, um, their, their missile complement. Okay, so as we mentioned before, things have settled down a little bit now, so I can decide where I want my dedicated strike aircraft to head. But first, what are these guys do? Ah, oh, yes, I launched this these aircraft last time to protect from an inbound missile strike. It looks like they've maybe put away uh, one missile, maybe. But they can stay on one station over here. All right, so the Lancers, you know what, I'm just going to combine them into one group. 
So I'm going to combine these aircraft into one group. I'll just press V to go into group mode. Now. Yeah. V to go into group mode. Drag select all of them to D to dis detach them from the group. Now I'm going to press G and combine them all into one group. Hmm. Let me try that. And I'm yes. Are they different? Okay, that's why they're not combining into a group. They need to all be the same loadout. That's uh, that's my fault there. I was wondering, looking at them, why I didn't launch them all as a group, but they're they're different loadouts. So for aircraft to be combined into a group, they have to have, to have the same loadout. Here we've got the JA SSM extended range, and these aircraft are armed with the JA SSM. Let's see what the difference is. The obviously one's extended range, the other one's not. So 215 nautical miles versus. Four hundred thirty. Yeah, that's a that's a big change. It's double double. So let's deliver our strike from a different direction. Uh, so hopefully we can wipe out some of the defenses here. And I, I mentioned quite a few times, I believe, uh, during the last stream that we. Uh, We've launched 200 TLAMs against the Crimean Peninsula. I don't expect them all to land, but the benefit is the, the more sort of missiles I can throw at them, the more surface to air missiles they're gonna to have to throw up to defend against them. And then the higher likelihood we have of uh, follow on attacks being successful. So there's a bit of air combat going on over here. Maybe it's not that wise to send the bombers that far that way. So what I'm doing here is I'm just gonna press Control D to get uh, the measurement tool up. Now I'm gonna press uh, control and insert to place a reference point, which I still have the view of disabled. This is probably staring me right in the face. Yeah, <laughs> as I mentioned, it's um, it's really early here. It's uh, just gone six thirty in the morning on a Saturday morning, so still a little bit slow on the uptake. It's pressing control R to rename it, and I'm going to call that the uh, JA SSM. Firing point. How fast are these? I reckon they're probably about 500 knots since about right for a cruise missile. 600 knots, even better. Okay, so you can fire from, I don't know, up here somewhere. See if we can get some missiles coming in that way. I believe uh, Australia has got JASSMs now. Um, yeah, that was in one of the scenarios that we, they, they do. Um, so a few people have pointed out that they are really, really expensive. <laughs> most most of the ordnance that uh, is long range these days is. I mean, we've got 200 TLMs flying over Turkey here. That's at least $200 million. Um, the JASSMs are going to be launched from the B1s, uh, you know, probably, what have we got, like 48 of them all up? No, it's going to be 60, uh, 72 all up. So that's, you know, at least $72 million there, roughly. I don't know. That's a ballpark. Um, 
got B2 flying in. There's lot. There's lots of money in the air at the moment. Lots and lots of taxpayers money in the air. Now, with the B2, I'm a little, it's low observable, but you know, how far do we want to test that? Do we want, do we want the B2 to fly over Crimea and then be spotted by, I don't know, by an eyeball or by an infrared sensor and then have it shot down? At the moment, I'm probably more comfortable to have it loiter over Romania uh, for a little while. In fact, we're going to send it towards the Romanian tanker track and we'll just make sure that's compatible with that tanker. So boom refueling is what we're looking for. Uh, we pretty much know the answer here. It can be boom refueling. Let's just double check. Wing drogue and center line boom. Okay, so the B2 is gonna to head to the Romanian tanker track. They're gonna refuel there. And before I send them in, I'm gonna give them a fighter escort um, just because they're loaded with laser guided bombs or no, JDAMs. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not happy risking that kind of aircraft uh, to just fly over the Crimean Peninsula where you know all of these really um, amazing SAMs are located. The, the B2 here, see, I noticed that it's got a terrain following radar and it's uh, able to flow, fly really low. I don't think... I think it'd, it'd be cool to fly them in really low and do like a, a low and... Well, I was going to say low and fast, but you know, how fast can this thing go? Probably not that fast. <laughs> yeah, um, a low and slow uh, penetration of, of Crimea. But I think I'll just keep them at, at, at altitude when they do do their strike. And uh, the other thing is, just because they're in the air and on their way there, it doesn't mean that they need to finish their strike. If it's not safe to go in and perform the strike, then they can just land at a nearby airbase or they can turn around and go home. But having them over Romania is a lot more useful um, for short, short notice on call uh, air support than having them based in, uh, in the UK. So the air defense situation, so, uh, someone has just asked, Newhauser has asked um, what the air defense situation on the eastern side of the sea of Azov is going around Crimea and attacking the east. Um, I'm not sure, there's, there's an awful lot of stuff going on over here. Is that Russia? Yeah, Russia. This is all Russian territory here. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there is a significant SAM presence there. We could uh, go and have a look. We've got some reconnaissance assets here. These are going to be slow, so it's going to take them forever to get on the station. Yeah. That's going to take eight hours for a UAV to get up there. I could send a U2 up, but I'm yeah. Oh, missiles firing. Okay, that's our aim one twenty is being fired the missiles here. Okay, so these, I'm not engaging. I wonder, these are, these are guided weapons, not uh, vampires. So they may be too small to be engaged by Amaranth. That's gonna be a problem. That's gonna be a big problem. I'm pretty sure they've got, they've got ESSMs. Okay, out of all of the surface ships, they've probably got the best chance of surviving because they've still got ESSMs left and SM1s. Uh, let's just hope that whatever these are, are able to be engaged by those weapons. Okay, 
So we're going to send some reconnaissance assets towards the uh, eastern side of the Sea of Azov. Um, the U2, I'll send up there because it's got really good, it's really good at recon, obviously. Um, my only concern is that, you know, th these were shot down by SA2s in the 1960s, so <laughs> whatever's up there now is uh, more than capable of shooting them down, so I just need to be careful with them. Um, while I'm here, I'm also going to make a, another uh, AEW track. That, that might be able to give us an ELINT uh, warning as well. So it's consistent. Let's go there. We got some. Typhoons. I'm also going to set up these tankers here and put them on a track just over Turkey. So we have a decided lack of tanker coverage over Turkey. We'll see what I've decided to name them as a convention when I open up the mission editor. So I believe I've got a few things going on here. Uh, okay, so these guys are doing well so far. Let's hope that that continues for them. Did I maybe not select them before? I don't know. <laughs> I think I might have just uh, not allocated them before. Maybe I had the wrong unit selected. Uh, okay, so these guys are returning to base. I don't want them to do that. I don't want them to do that until they are Winchester or at least a shotgun. It looks like they've just uh, followed normal doctrine there, which is to um, have one engagement BVR and then head home. But just considering the situation uh, where you know they are the primary missile defense for a lot of vessels out here. No, I'm just going to try and get it on station for a little while. So I'm going to unassign them by pressing new key. I've set them a course that they should follow automatically. They've still got plenty of fuel. Um, let's go to their doctrine settings, weapon state. We'll set them to, let's just say that they are Winchester before they head home. So they're going to use all of their AMRAMs, all of their sidewinders, um, if there's any targets of opportunity, I'll engage them with guns, and then after that, they can go home. Yeah, things are getting pretty tense here. You hear the 76 millimeter gun go off? Okay, yeah. Oh, okay, well, the one that... Uh, Probably didn't matter, missed. So the um, the Turkish frigate uh, Gemlik has uh, has been hit by some sort of guided weapon and it's sinking. Um, that was a Perry class frigate. Uh, that's no good. I served on one of those. It's not, not nice to see one of them get hit. Hey Russ, um, so Russ has just asked if there's uh, 
a YouTube video or channel that explains what this game is and how to get started. Uh, Belugan, B-A-L-O-O-G-A-N, uh, made some really, really good uh, videos. Um, they're based on older versions of, um, of Command, so there's, there's new features since then, but they're, they're a pretty good intro to the, um, to the game. Uh, also, if you've got any questions while while we're streaming here, just ask, and I'll do my best to answer them. So we've got our tea lambs flying over central uh, central western Turkey. Um, you know, I wonder if there is. Yeah. I think the laundromats in the town of Afyon Karashia. Uh, probably murder the pronunciation there. The laundromats in this town here are probably uh, going to be working overtime. Has all these uh, tea lamps fly overhead. I think there's going to be a lot of soiled underwear. Okay, you two is uh, up out of Akrotiri. Just gonna have them stay south of the border for the moment and head over to uh, northern Turkey. Once I get closer, I'm gonna put up some air escorts. Uh, some more harm shooters. I'm gonna launch these uh, harm shooters out of uh, Merzifon. It's getting to be about the right time for them to follow the T-Land and strike in. Uh, the cluster bombs, they can stay on the ground because they're just going to die. Um, the recon pod though, I'm actually going to use that aircraft to go and identify these, uh, these vessels here. find out where we want those B-52s to launch their weapons from. So they're carrying uh, CALCMs, what's that going to stand for? The Conventional Attack Land Cruise Missile, something like that. Five hundred nautical miles. Okay, so we've got launch points set up for all of our uh, bomber aircraft. Uh, and the idea basically is to start saturating their air defenses here with, with more and more missiles. until they get on station. So the um, the DAG Laboon here is heading to the Black Sea. I'll leave it doing that. Um, it's probably going to take a long time for them to get on, on station. Mark these as uh, unfriendly because, in general, anything that is moving at that kind of speed towards a friendly uh, vessel is going to be unfriendly. Well, I guess your job is uh, is done, <laughs> not, not not completed, but uh, you know finished. Um, this, this group here was protecting that uh, that vessel there, and uh, that seems like it's no longer necessary. So we're just going to keep them on station. 
Uh, they can provide some air defense. Maybe even head them up towards, yeah, actually that's probably a better idea. Okay, so things have calmed down a little bit. It got pretty hectic there. Um, so we've, we've basically had hostilities going for nearly, nearly one hour of game time. Um, and a lot's happened. So we've... Just having a look at our losses and expenditures. Lost. 11 aircraft. Uh, and, and a Seahawk that was on a, on a vessel. Uh, three, three surface ships. And in exchange, uh, there's been a whole bunch of Russian aircraft destroyed, which I think I mentioned in the um, in the briefing was was not all done by us, but a lot of it was uh, done by the Ukrainian forces. There's a lot of air to ground and uh, and basically just combat going on in this area here. Um, at the moment, there's not awfully much we can do to help there. We've got our own uh, we've got our own problems to deal with with the um, anti anti ship missile threat in the uh, Black Sea. Once we have uh, conducted, sorry, once once you know this uh, salvo of tomahawks has um, impacted their targets, then we can start following up with uh, with you know follow on strikes here to eliminate the um, air defences, and uh, and then then hopefully we can start to try and establish some air superiority over the Crimean Peninsula. Uh, so Vakapad has uh, mentioned that they're not getting any sound. Um, I've had people sort of interacting with me, talking to me, so <laughs> I presume they can hear what I'm saying. Um, if anyone else is not getting sound, let me know, and uh, I'll see if there's any settings I can change on this end. change the name of that mission because West doesn't really mean much. Um, let's say let's say Western Europe. Okay, our uh, F-16s out of Turkey are starting to take off. Okay, we've got our shooters here. Right, more missiles. More missiles inbound. So I just uh, ordered this flight here to attack uh, these these weapons that are coming in. Because the weapons are moving so fast, um, they've actually angled to intercept down here somewhere. What I'm going to do instead is uh, manually assign them to head, head this way and also increase their speed to afterburner um, because I'm trying to protect this vessel here. And intercepting the, the weapons down here does me no good in that. Okay, so Vakapad's got sound sorted out. Glad, glad to hear that it's sorted. That's good. This is my um, my third stream now, Simon. You can probably tell I'm a bit more comfortable doing it, but uh, still got a lot to learn. So if there's any issues anyone has with sound or any anything else, do let me know and I'll try and sort it out. OK, 
Okay. So let's see if we can engage these weapons here. Right. Also gonna need to change altitude. So I think because these weapons are so small and moving so fast, our radar is having trouble tracking them. Which is really bad news for the crew of HMS Duncan. Yeah, that definitely does seem to be the case. Finally got some missiles. So I guess it I guess it is a size issue. Um, I'm just gonna allocate two weapons each because you know it's pretty it's pretty important we shoot these down. Um, so obviously it is a issue with the with the size of the target, um, the aircraft. Radar needs to be a little bit closer to be effective at engaging, and probably the slant range um, is affected by altitude there as well. Yeah, great. It's funny that uh, you know we spend so much time in this uh, game zoomed out to a level that you know what's the camera altitude here like 705 kilometers that it looks like things are moving slowly but when you zoom in to you know uh, these are what six just coming over the horizon now um, they're moving really fast so they would have just come over the horizon probably at about this point which is about seven nautical miles from uh, the Duncan and. Yeah, things are things are all moving very quickly. So from the missile coming over the horizon, they've got like fifteen seconds worth of time to defend themselves. I mean, considering that most uh, shipboard missiles need a direct line of sight for their radar um, directors to engage the weapons, it makes you realise how quickly everything moves in modern warfare with missiles. Okay, well that went well. Now uh, we are going to follow these harms, uh, these uh, tomahawks in with our harms, and see if we can. I uh, know first slammers, so they can go down to the loiter. There's one here with harms, I believe. That's the one. Again, they can go down to loiter. Yeah. To 36,000 feet, and we'll leave this flight here on station as our as our air defences. Um, they've only got seven AMRAMs and seven sidewinders, but for the moment, that's that's better than what uh, the Duncan's got. Let's put them on station directly over the Duncan, slow them down to loiters, so they're not burning up all their fuel.
are these guys? Ah, okay, that's the uh, recon aircraft. Okay. Yeah, so I feel like um, with recon aircraft, so this is carrying a recon pod. Um, all of my experience from, you know, like uh, Falcon 4.0 and stuff tells me that, you know, you should be flying really low and fast with your recon pod. Um, you know, on a clear day, when there's uh, when there's no clouds, there's probably no reason to fly really low over these aircraft, uh, over these uh, vessels. All that's going to do is expose me to um, anti-aircraft fire that I won't be exposed to flying at 36,000 feet. Any modern kind of recon pod is definitely going to be able to pick out what these vessels are from 36,000 feet without any issue. Um, so it's much safer to stay at high altitude unless you're required to go to low altitude. Uh, that depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for things like ground targets, which are camouflaged, then yeah, yeah, it is it is much better to be at a low altitude. But for picking out vessels on water, uh, 36,000 feet is fine and a lot safer. I'm wondering what I can do about this group here. Um, probably not very much. I, I don't think that I've got enough air power oriented towards ship strikes that we could uh, make an effective strike. Sorry, apologies for that. I just knocked the uh, socket out of my um, microphone and uh, I think I uh, caused a bit of feedback there. So I don't think I've got enough um, air power to effectively uh, strike these uh, these vessels here. Um, so probably just better to let them go for the moment rather than doing an effective strike. Wait, wait until I've got the resources to do it effectively. So during the first stream, some of you guys suggested that I, um, that I try out DCS. Um, I, I've had DCS for a long time, like years and years, and uh, I only ever played, I think, three hours um, was the amount of time that I had on Steam. And from memory, that was that was a pretty frustrating three hours. Um, I downloaded a different module, which is uh, the AV8B, and in the last week, my hours have gone from like three hours to I think 36 or something like that. I really, really enjoyed it been heaps of fun. Uh, the reason I mention that is because of the targeting pod. The targeting pod in um, in that DCS module has um, has been interesting to see how it's modeled. Um, there's been a few moments of frustration where you know the TDC slew hasn't worked the way I wanted it to or whatever but I'm starting to get a hang of it now. But uh, thank you to the people that recommended DCS because I'm, I'm really enjoying that. Um, and you can probably look forward to Harriers being included in one of my scenarios in the future because they, they, I've always thought they're cool, but now that I've flown one in DCS, they're, they're definitely getting a showing in one of my own scenarios. Send these guys to a marshal point here. And just increase their speed to military. Get them on station quicker. Yeah, so a few people talking about DCS in the um, in the chat. It's uh, it is really good. It's very seems to be very high fidelity. Seems to be very realistic. Um, the only 
barrier really that I've noticed is that you, you pretty much need to have a, um, a throttle and joystick. Um, pedals are, are probably highly recommended. I've got pedals, but I prefer to use a twist joystick um, just because I find that I'm really uncoordinated with the rudder pedals. But for me, that the only issue with that is that you know when I when I go to work, um, I can't take that kind of stuff with me because I work on a ship, and uh, you know we're only limited to I think it's twelve kilos of luggage for three weeks. So, not to mention the fact that you know um, it looks pretty <laughs> it's pretty obvious that I'm playing a game when uh, when I've got a joystick and, and throttle out. Um, so, yeah, that's the only real downside to it for me. I just want these harm shooters to slow down a little bit. No point in going ahead of the Tomahawk Strike. Um, so the plan for the harms is to wait until the uh, air defense radars activate over here. Um, and then when the air defense radars have activated, um, that's when we're gonna start slinging harms. What I don't wanna do though, is have the air defense radars activate so that they can shoot down my aircraft. Um, because that kind of defeats the whole purpose. So just slow them down a little bit, and then I've asked them to essentially loiter in place. Oh, more missiles are coming. Duncan's doing pretty good. They've, um, I think, uh, <laughs> stress levels on Duncan are probably pretty high, but um, they have uh, they've done well to survive this long. They've had a fair bit of protection coming in from the uh, Turkish Air Force. Let's see if we can maintain that. So for short range sorties, like uh, these ones flying out of Merzifon and attacking, you know, the Crimean Peninsula, what, 250 nautical miles away. Um, I'm, I'm not that afraid to sort of put them up to military speed. In general, I'm pretty conservative with how fast my aircraft are going. I don't want them to be burning up all their fuel. Um, but putting these guys up to military speed just to catch up uh, with this flight here so that things arrive in a more coordinated fashion, I'm happy to do that. Um, we've also got plenty of tanker assets and, you know, Worst comes to worst, they uh, jettison their ordinance and go home. So all those tea lambs overflying Duncan, uh, they're probably happy to see some friendly ordnance flying nearby. A bit of the Empire Strikes Back. Now, U2, where's that? U2's headed up there. You know, it, U2's are really cool. Um, the SR-71, I think, is the definition of cool. Um, I was lucky enough to see two of them um, the last time that I visited the US. Now, it's amazing to, believe, to, to see that the SR-71, which was once you know so highly classified, is now stuck in parking lots at museums and uh, and you know just uh, out on deck at a at a, another museum where you can go up and basically touch it. Um, to think that those were once so highly classified that you know I'm not sure how many things will be classified higher uh, more highly, and now they're just uh, sitting in 
sitting outside in public view makes you wonder what else is um, replaced them and also what else is out there now. But uh, what got me onto that is the U2 that's headed up there. I was just thinking it would be nice to have a um, SR71 type asset to do an overflight here and see what, what kind of threat we've got. However, every time that I've used an SR71 in game, I've, uh, I've lost it. And it's probably because I'm just treating them too cavalier, <laughs> sort of treating them like, them like they're invincible when they're not invincible. They're very hard to hit, but they're not invincible. Um, so maybe it's a good thing we don't have an SR71 because I would probably just lose it. Uh, no, when when I would visit the US last time, the first one I saw was at uh, the it was in California, I think, a science museum, and the other one was at uh, the aircraft carrier museum in New York. I think it's the Enterprise. I think. But both were um, both were purpose purpose uh, both trips were purposely meant just to go and see the SR-71, everything else that was at both sides. It was nice to see. Like, it was cool to see an F-14 as well, um, but it was mainly about the SR-71. It's such a cool aircraft. Okay, not really much going on over Moldova, which is nice. You know, I mean, the um, the whole reason we we are here, according to the briefing, is to make sure that Moldova uh, remains independent. Ukraine seems to be uh, doing a decent job of looking after themselves as well for the last half hour, and uh, really the um, the <laughs> the brunt of Russian attention seems to have shifted to us. Um, so. The Black Sea has become uh, basically a, a repository for missiles. <laughs> There's um, more dollars in, uh, more taxpayer dollars in missiles flying over the back of Black Sea than I can imagine anywhere in history. Um, we've got our tomahawks coming in. I might start heading this. Uh, this is what I was worried about. I was worried about triggering some SAM attacks against these aircraft. This aircraft here, or this flight here, I'm gonna send them north just momentarily. Let's, let's actually just pick out a proper target for them. The sand battalion that is causing me so much grief is probably a good uh, good target for their slammers. So they're going to fire all of those off, and then if I were to let things happen uh, automatically, they would just turn around and fly home. But I'm actually going to change their doctrine so that once they've loosed their missiles they will not go home um, and we'll keep them around for air defense using their uh, AMRAMs. Ah, okay. So, because they're if I was to choose Winchester, they would still go home because their um, their mission specific loadout weapons are the slammers. So what I'm gonna do instead is just do weapons state RTB. No, they do not reach. No, they do not return home. Um, so that there would be mission Winchester in that, you know, they fired all their slammers and that's what they're out there to do. But I wanna keep them around for their, um, for their anti-air loadout that remains. That's the great thing about uh, multi-role aircraft is that you can use them in uh, multiple roles.
So you might you might have noticed that the uh, the missile alert tone that I use is different to um, the stock one. Uh, it's actually the same. It's actually the same uh, alert tone that was used on the the Perry class frigate that I served on for action stations. Um, and I found that when I first started using it, uh, even after you know what, what, like eight years now, of, no, seven years of being out of the uh, of the navy, whenever I hear that um, that tone, it sort of still gives me a bit of a fight or flight response. So I ended up speeding it up a little bit so it sounds slightly different. And now now it doesn't stress me out quite as much. But um, it's funny how our brains work you know you associate a um, sound with, uh, with an activity for long enough and then when you hear it you know seven years later it still brings back the adrenaline rush not that uh, not that it was ever sounded in actual combat when I was on board because you know no combat for us but um, always always uh, every day be doing exercises and that alarm still makes me makes me nervous when I hear it So with the Tomahawks, they're actually able to change their uh, waypoints on the fly. With the Slammers, because they're, they're obviously you know, run by a different computer um, in, inside the, the missile, I mean, and they have different technology aboard, you actually can't do that. So it's interesting to see the, the difference in technology. Um, anyone who watched the last stream will probably have noticed how impressed <laughs> I was. Um, with being able to change the uh, the Tomahawk's uh, waypoints in flight. I guess it's little things that impress us, but um, I thought that was pretty cool. I'm used to, like I think I've mentioned a few times, I'm used to playing um, scenarios that are set. Sort of, uh, my area of interest is really, I guess, the uh, mid-80s through to the mid-2000s. Um, although I'm starting to become more and more interested in current, uh, current settings. But... For someone who's used to playing, you know, with much older equipment, it's really, really impressive to be able to just change the waypoints on the fly of a cruise missile. Okay, so our growlers have uh, decelerated to loiter speed, which is what we wanted. Uh, okay, I've got six minutes before they arrive on the station there. That's pretty. So I've just set a course for the growlers, and it's occurred to me that, you know, this, this is basically a support track. I may as well just set up a support track. Um, the benefit of setting up support track versus just leaving that um, that course plotted there is that you know I can I can go and do other things and not worry about it after I've set up a support track. But if I leave that course there and they reach the end of it, then they're just going to rotate in place. So I've turned off their manual waypoints and just set everything to auto and they'll just continuously fly that loop on, on loader. That's fine, that's exactly what we want. We've got some protection for them over here and their friendly vessels. Okay, now it's time for these arms to head in. 
palm shoot is, I should say. Uh, so Vakapad has asked whether a unit in, whether the game simulates uh, communications. Um, it does, it does, and it simulates them. It doesn't simulate a lag, so so to speak. So if you give your unit an order, it's going to happen instantaneously. Um, with the features added with the um, Chains of War DLC, one of them is communications loss. So. Um, if your aircraft, for example, takes enough damage or takes damage in a specific part of it, which you know affects the uh, communications, then you'll lose contact with that aircraft. And then it will basically go autonomous, which means that let's say, let's say this aircraft or this group here lost communications. At the moment, they have no orders. So they would just orbit here until they went bingo and then they would head home. Um, they would essentially do, you know, the last thing you told them to do, they would keep doing that until something changed, which would usually stimulate them to go home. Um, aircraft that are on a mission will still continue that mission however this is just losing comms in isolation often losing comms is a result of damage and generally when aircraft take damage they will turn around and head home so when you have for example one aircraft in this uh in this group gets hit by triple a and loses comms but that's it let's say it's only got you know like 0.1 percent damage it will it will detach and it will head home um the issue you often have then, and this, this actually happened uh, a fair bit in real life, is that you've then got an aircraft that's sort of off the grid headed towards one of your bases. Um, and if your rules of engagement for surface to air missiles are pretty lax, then there is a good chance that guy is gonna get shot down by their own uh, air defenses on the way home. That happened at least once in the Falklands, and I'm sure it happened uh, many other times. I mean, I reckon probably in the Iran, Iraq war, it would have happened. So yeah, it's, um, that's a potential consequence of losing comms there. Okay, let's get these harm shooters in. Let's get them to loose off their weapons and then let's get them out of there. So because I'm streaming, I'm sort of eyeballing uh, a lot of things that I would usually take the time to work out a bit more precisely. However, I don't think it's going to be all that interesting for you guys to watch me sit down and, you know, like try and work out with a calculator how to do a time on time and target strike here. And it's, it's honestly, it's not that complex, but uh, it's still 7.23 in the morning here in Melbourne. So <laughs> not really up to it on a Saturday, um, Saturday morning. There are some really good tools out there. Uh, one, one in particular, I can't remember who made it. It was a community member and it was posted on the Matrix forums. It was an Excel sheet um, that was a time on target calculator. Um, and that had really good feedback from the people that used it. I tend to just use the, um, use the information box down here, which gives you your range from selected unit as in conjunction with the uh, the ruler tool, which you can access by pressing Control D, uh, tend to use that, and you know, like rough estimates. And if I need something really precise, I will break out the calculator. But as you saw before, when I was working out how long the Tomahawks were going to land, were going to take before they landed, you know, the rough estimates that they're good enough. Um, and in reality, for working out a time on target strike for you know, like 50 aircraft in a theater. That's going to be the job of a, of a group of people over the course of several days, not one person sitting at a computer with a, um, a calculator and a, and a ruler trying to figure things out in, you know, in five minutes. Uh, Soto has just joined us. Hello. Good morning. Uh, good morning, my time. Probably good evening, your time. I imagine that uh, most viewers are in, in the European or US um, time zones. 
And to anyone that is in my own time zone, you know, thanks for your dedication, getting up early to come and watch. So I'm just going to keep these guys heading in at military. Their uh, colleagues down here are heading in at afterburner. Uh, they could, you know, potentially make it all the way there on afterburner and then turn around and bingo, but uh, we'll probably back it off a little bit once they catch up to their friends. Let's zoom out for the bigger picture and see what's going on. So we've still got our bomber slash strike aircraft heading it. Well, not slash, bomber, uh, bomber aircraft with strike loadouts are headed in. Um, they are probably an hour or so away from their firing points. We've got AWACS cover over Romania. Uh, we've got tanker tracks over Romania. Ah, yes, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the side doctrine to not use tankers. Now the reason for that is not because I want no one to use tankers, it's because I don't want anyone to use tankers unless I specifically direct them to. Uh, these guys may have tied my hands a little bit. I'm going to go off after burning now. Oh yeah, they've got plenty of range. Okay, so I was I was concerned that they weren't going to make it home, but 353 nautical miles, they could go. Yeah, they've got plenty of, plenty of range. Missiles coming in for the Duncan. So I'll just set these air okay. So these aircraft are going to attack these missiles here. Uh, not quite over the Duncan just yet. I'm gonna send these guys in to attack as well. Be interested to find out what these weapons are that are moving at Mach 2.2 at 30 feet. Um, yeah, the Duncan is still kicking, hasn't taken any damage. Um, presuming that they get out of here and get back to the Bosphorus and get through it safely, I would be recommending that all of the crew buy a lottery ticket on the way home. <laughs> They've been very lucky. So there's lots of uh, lots of targets there for the harms. Yeah. And this was yeah, Slava, Slava class uh, cruiser basically. 
See, I, I want to fire the harms against uh, these emitters here, but I, I, I kind of know that, you know, um, four harms against a Russian uh, surface group is just, they're just going to be shot out of the sky. They're not going to do anything. So instead, I'm going to bring these guys down to really low altitude. Might turn auto evasion off just so they do exactly as I say and don't sort of take any measures to save their own skin beyond what I'm doing. The idea is that I'll get them below the radar horizon here, so hopefully before these go active on their own, although that's not looking very likely. Um, hopefully we can evade these missiles. If not, uh, oh, it's looking like it's working. I don't know if they're just missing or if we're actually evading. Uh, it looks like they're uh, we're actually evading. Yes, fantastic, that worked. Good. I knew that was going to work. There was no doubt. Uh, actually, you know what? You can stay at really low altitude, just so it's probably a little bit safer for you. Uh, and once we start getting some threat emitters popping up over here, that's when we'll, we'll uh, pop up and start firing off arms. Okay, President of Ukraine is on TV condemning NATO's in action, demanding yada yada yada. Okay, well, I mean, they're condemning our actions, <laughs> in action. Uh, we don't have authority to engage these Russian ground forces that are giving them so much trouble. Um, we don't have the operational parameters met to start looking at air, air superiority over Ukraine. But you know, this guy, he's, uh, he's losing lots of his own troops, so I understand them being unhappy about that. Uh, the intelligence picture is starting to clear up. Russian army units are passing past the Donbass. Southwest towards Crimea. Okay, yeah, well, that's... Uh, that's unfortunate, but uh, we can only do what we can do. Let's see if the $200 million T-Lamp strike uh, changes anything. So Duncan still lives. But Duncan is now completely out of Sam's. So I think Duncan's days are numbered, really. Yeah, that fuck can go home. Uh, so this, uh, Vakapad's brought up a, a good point in that, you know, would uh, would NATO really do much if Ukraine got attacked properly? That that aside, that particular scenario aside, um, one of the things about making command scenarios is having them really super ultra realistic uh, means that probably not much is going to happen. Um, I mean, we, we've actually had a really peaceful uh, 100 years or so, no, not 100 years, 50 years or so uh, since the end of World War II, um, largely due to the threat of uh, mutually assured destruction. That keeps a lot of things in check. Um, and also, you know, there's, there's political mechanisms, things happen fairly slowly. So the idea of, um, of you know, Russia just starting to attack uh, vessels in the Black Sea, just kind of because they're there, probably wouldn't happen in real life. but to play that in a game wouldn't be all that interesting either. So I think um, it's fair for scenario designers to take a little bit of liberty with uh, with what would happen in real life in order to make an interesting game. Um, obviously it's important to strike a balance. Uh, I think anyone that plays Command uh, plays it because of its realism. Um, but at the same time, 
unless we're modeling historical conflicts, the, the uh, options for people to, to simulate realistic events from a political and, uh, and practical side of things are, are kind of limited, so we need to give a little bit of leeway there. Uh, so Amona um, has asked, is it possible to rearm VLS cells while ships are at sea? Um, from what I understand, not really. Um, it, it is probably possible on paper, but from a practical point of view, um, it would be quite difficult. Uh, certainly, yeah, I'm not sure how much I can say about that, but certainly my, um, my understanding uh, from open source intelligence is that um, it's not a practical thing to do at sea. You know, doing doing replenishment at sea and taking on fuel and uh, and things like I don't know uh, seventy six millimeter shells at sea is difficult enough. Um, actually, craning across uh, VLS loads and putting them into a VLS launcher while you're actually at sea would be very very difficult. Um, so I, I think really the short answer there is no. That said, though, I know that um, during the Cold War, I think some of the Soviet doctrine was to have dedicated sub-tenders to rearm their cruise missile subs at sea. So it's probably not impossible. I think it's probably more impractical um, under most circumstances. Certainly uh, for Duncan, which is out here all on their lonesome, um, it would not be possible. Uh, well, sorry, it would not be practical, especially with all the, um, the missiles flying around to get out of the crane and start popping VLS cells in. Uh, but maybe if, you know, if they had calm seas, no threat, not, not uh, inconceivable. This is going to be risky for this flight here. We're putting them up to um, medium altitude to start looking for uh, targets for their harms. Almost certainly, yeah, I was about to say, almost certainly this uh, surface group here is going to fire on them. Yeah, maybe, maybe it is worth just firing those harms there to, to suppress them a little bit. We'll see. See if it actually does any good. Actually, you know what, instead, I'm going to fire their arms at that. I think they can go home. <laughs> Otherwise, they're going to get so close to the uh, Russian air defenses that they are just never going to get out of there and they will die. So instead of sending them on a suicide mission, I'm going to uh, fire their missiles at a target that I kind of know where it is. Put them down to minimum altitude, add afterburner, and they're gonna RTB. Okay, so these have been identified as uh, Nanuchka 3s. Got the hot dog stack there, three, three surface to surface missiles. So they're probably, I'd say that they've probably fired their six service, service missiles. They're probably not that much of a threat. However, we've got some aircraft with cluster bombs hanging around with not much to do. Ah, but can they attack? No, okay, well, that, that's the end of that. They can't attack. Can't attack ships. Uh, so, Vakapad has uh, said, I thought it was Nanushka, but I mean, my pronunciation is almost certainly incorrect. Um, so, <laughs> whatever I say, if you've heard something different, the other person's probably right.
All right, so our slammers are starting to get close to their targets. They're being engaged by surface to air missiles. This is what we want. This is we want basically all of these air defenses here in the Crimean Peninsula to start wasting their SAMs, um, defending against Tomahawks. Or if they don't, uh, if they don't uh, waste their SAMs, then they hopefully can get wiped out. Yeah, it looks like uh, Saki has joined us just in time. The Tomahawk missile strike is basically commencing. Um, we worked out earlier that it's going to probably be 30 minutes from the first impact to the last impact. So the next uh, 30 minutes or so of game time should be pretty much non-stop TLAM action. So our recon aircraft has identified all these uh, vessels here, which is what we wanted. Right, what is this? ECM aircraft are up there providing ECM coverage. Got some harm shooters heading in. Alright, let's see if we can Gonna launch some harms against this uh, service to a missile site. What could it be? Okay. Compared to whatever else is shooting at us, it's pretty small potatoes. But you know, it's a target nonetheless. SEAL teams providing good BDA and recon for uh, for our weapons. So things have, uh, things have settled down significantly uh, compared to when we first started the stream. When we first started the stream, it was about 45 minutes after hostilities had started. Um, and we'd, we'd lost some aircraft. We ended up losing a significant amount of our F-15s. We also lost an F-35. Yeah, 10, 10 F-15s we lost. And also the F-35. Um, not to mention, you know, the uh, US destroyer, the two frigates, uh, as well the Turkish and Bulgarian ones. 
So, yeah, there's been a lot of activity in the Black Sea, but things have settled down a little bit now. It seems like it's our turn to start uh, putting some hurt back on the bad guys. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm going to stick with bad guys. I mean, they attacked us first, so I think bad guys is fair. I haven't seen much of a submarine threat yet, which is a good thing. I don't want a submarine threat. Uh, actually, I'm going to assign these guys to the E-Link track. They can join their, uh, I believe it was some sort of British aircraft. Uh, so I think pretty much all of the aircraft losses so far have been to service to air missiles. Um, last stream I went a little bit over time because we, we were sort of waiting for uh, for our three hour slot for most of it I was setting things up and waiting to get into the action then when the action happened um, it was towards the end of the stream so I stuck around for half an hour and I think I kind of rushed things a little bit too much got a little bit careless and you know that's that's my excuse for these in the uh, F-35 and the F-15s. Yeah, kind of, kind of like what's happened here. I've just been distracted with um, talking, and uh, we've got lots of Sams coming in on these aircraft here. Mm. So I just allocated the harms from that group there. I mean, not, not sure how many of them are going to survive. But the ones that do, we want them to get their weapons off and get out of there. You know, these Russian surface to air missiles are really, really good. You know what? It's not worth it. I'm, uh, I'm going to pull the uh, pull the S16s back a little bit. They can wait a little bit longer until they start firing off their missiles. It's just um, too many of them are getting shot down. So I've, I've just lost three. Of them. So I understand that uh, these are currently not able to fire, but hopefully as soon as we get into firing parameters, they will fire. If not, uh, things are gonna be heating up on the Duncan again. Uh, and now that they're out of all their surface to missiles, I think you know this is gonna be the volley that takes them out. Um, I mentioned during the last stream that you know with, uh, with modern air defenses, it's not gonna be, most likely, it's not gonna be a single strike that takes out a, um, 
a modern surface vessel and certainly not a modern surface group, it's going to be multiple sustained strikes that um, that deplete the, their defences and then finally allow uh, leakers to start getting through and uh, and making impacts. And you know, once the first impact causes damage and reduces the ability to defend themselves, then the follow-on strikes are going to be easy. Very similar to the um, the principles that we've applied up here, actually. So it looks like the TLAM strike here is going to be sort of the opening for our uh, our bombers to start conducting effective strikes against um, the targets on the Crimean Peninsula. Uh, once those cruise missile strikes have been conducted, then that's probably going to be a more more appropriate time to bring in our. Um, our combat aircraft to conduct follow-on strikes. Hopefully they can use their aim nine X's to engage the although it's starting to look less and less likely, probably out of DLZ by now. Whatever these things are, they're good. They're on a track that might see the miss. If they overshoot, then uh, nope. <laughs> it's almost like they heard me. Um, yeah. Hopes are not high for Duncan surviving this. There's only two guided weapons left, but uh, yeah, there's more on the way after that. Yeah, I think Duncan's a goner. Let's hope for sea with. Is that Seawiz? It was. Seawiz saves the day again. Let's see if it can do it again. Seawiz saves the day twice in a row. Well, R2D2. Is it a Phalanx? Yeah. So the Phalanx is uh, nicknamed R2D2, and you can see why. Um, I've seen at least one that was painted to look like R2-D2 from Star Wars. Okay, these guys have done more than enough. Well, you know, depending on how you look at it, they've done more than I asked them to initially. Joint taking off. Now we've got a lot of assets in the Adriatic and Mediterranean that we haven't really brought into play yet. Mm, mainly support aircraft from there. Okay, some more air defenses. I might actually, I wonder what. Hmm. I'm thinking about forward basing these guys, about sending them over to perhaps Besmia to, um, to run out of there.
So I am going to do that. I'm just going to rearm these guys with um, with more AMRAMs than irises. That'll take them off now to get ready. And all of these Euro fighters, I'm going to actually going to forward base over to Bez now. So I'm going to create a uh, ferry mission. So they'll, they'll fly over there. Um, once they land, presuming it takes them less than two hours, which it should do. How far away are we? Yeah, it's gonna take them about an hour to get there. Once they land, um, they'll have quick turnaround. So they'll be ready half an hour later, and then they'll be ready for um, offensive air ops. And then afterwards, we can pass them back to that place. Geo de I've already been called out once for my pronunciation. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> so Duncan have been extremely lucky so far. Um, but, you know, that, that can't last forever. Let's see. Just bringing this aircraft group back to attack this guy that we've been here. Let's see if we can get Duncan safe. Um, So I initially had assigned this aircraft group to attack that weapon there, um, but they're, they're just never going to catch up. So they're going home. These guys are attacking from more uh, advantageous positions, so hopefully they should be able to get into parameters to engage with their axes. Okay, so that's what we want to see. They're starting to volley the SAMs to protect themselves, which is good, because the, the more of them they fire now, the, the more that they can't shoot at our aircraft. Wondering about maybe sending these aircraft to refuel. Yeah, I will. Oh, Duncan, <laughs> Duncan, by the sounds of it, Duncan's Seawiz saved it again. R2-D2 is working overtime. Uh, how many ASMs are still going for me? There are none on the scope at the moment, but what looks, what looks to be happening is that this surface group is launching volleys of probably about four at a time. Um, which is not a bad tactic, really. I mean, if they sent all of them at once, they would probably overwhelm my defenses and sink me. But this is a more conservative way of um, of wearing down my defenses and then then eventually sinking me. Uh, that, the benefit of that for the enemy is that it keeps some of their um, ASMs to be used at a later date against a different target. So we still have these frigates here which I'm actually going to vector to avoid that SSM, uh, SSV, sorry. That SSV has already caused enough trouble by identifying, uh, I believe it was the Sullivans and a Bulgarian frigate. Uh, so Newhauser asked how they are detecting us. If you're talking about the vessel, 
they probably have an OX trap on us. They probably have a um, airborne early warning radar you know, somewhere around here um, that has a decent contact on it. And it would have identified uh, the contact by ESM, probably either ESM or maybe one of the SSVs uh, identified it visually. Um, but as long as they are uh, keeping a track with some sort of sensor, and it'll, it'll be an active sensor to have that kind of weapons quality trace on them. Um, then that's how they're doing that. Now, that's a frog foot, which is a com close air support aircraft. I'm just trying to see if we can find any AEW type aircraft that could be causing that grief. Oh, I can't see any. AEW aircraft are a nice juicy target to go after. Uh, and if you can get rid of enough of them, it really will um, will change your uh, will change the outcome of the battle. So Newhouse has asked uh, whether changing our MCOM will help. Yeah, probably at this stage, no. Um, I would say that they have some sort of weapons quality track on us. Whether it could even be over the horizon radar, um, and if if that's the case, then turning off our radar will do not much apart from make us less situationally aware. Um, the, the phase where I would consider MCON to be really beneficial for the Duncan is well and truly over. Um, in that, that would be the phase where we want them to um, remain undetected and if detected unidentified, we can assume seeing as they are getting uh, weapons thrown at them at pretty high intensity, that they are detected and identified. So just turning their radar off now means that they'll probably still remain on the enemy's scope but be less situationally aware. I could be wrong, um, but that's just the way I'm gonna play this. So someone's saying that there is a uh, AEW on the other side of Ukraine. If you can give me a positional reference, that'd be great because I've got a lot, a lot going on on my screen and I can't really pick out where it is. So TLAM's still headed in. I think there's just a little bit of a lull there. There was a bit of a gap in, in sort of coverage. Uh, so AWACS stands for Airborne Warning and Control. Um, I'm not sure if the S is part of the actual acronym, but Airborne Warning Control is what it stands for. I guess the difference between AEW and AWACS is AWACS is probably a branch of AEW. Uh, you can get helicopters that are designed for AEW and they just have a big radar that is airborne and can look down on uh, on targets. Whereas AWACS um, is, adds the control side in as well. So in an E3 aircraft, for example, there's something like between 12 and 20 staff on board. Um, at, at, significant number of which are dedicated to actually controlling the airborne, uh, sorry, the, um, the aircraft in their sphere of influence. Whereas strictly AEW aircraft uh, just provide sensor updates. Um, you know, a AWACS is obviously a, a division of that. So the, the terms do overlap, but I guess that's the distinction you're looking for. Like a lot of things in, um, in military terminology, because there are differing definitions and differing uh, origins of these definitions, then you're, you're going to get a, a bit of overlap in a lot of terminology. Okay, so I can't see any anything else for our air, recon aircraft to do. They've still got heaps of fuel. Uh, single aircraft on a dome, two AMRAMs, two sidewinders. Uh, they can go home. They've done their job.
So all the surface traffic in the Black Sea at the moment is hostile. And it's all been positively identified as hostile. There was some Ukrainian frigates up here, but uh, based on what's happened to our vessels, I assume they are probably no more. Okay, so our EF-2000 Eurofighters have started taking off from the, uh, <laughs> the airbase in Italy that I'm not going to try and pronounce. They're headed towards uh, Besmia in uh, Bulgaria. Once they land there and refuel and get ready to go again, we'll consider putting them into operation uh, in the, the Black Sea area. The air threat seems to have settled down quite a lot. So we've still got some fences up, but that's probably an ACM aircraft, I'd imagine. No, it's a recon aircraft. Yeah. Okay, e -Lint. Not too worried about that. That could be what's actually detecting the Duncan, but it's too well defended to go after at the moment. Um, Oh, I will do that. Where is that nearest tanker? Hmm. I'm going to send these guys down to keep an eye out for Duncan. So what is going to be the difference between these guys and Duncan? Because these guys aren't the, when I say these guys, I'm talking about the, uh, the two frigates here. They're not getting any attention. Duncan, on the other hand, it's MCON is actually buttoned down already. So I think it was Newhouse suggested, you know, would cutting down my MCON help? Uh, it's already, they're already MCON silent, apart from when they're uh, detecting missiles coming in. I believe their, um, their situational awareness is being provided by this uh, wedge tail here. So there's got to be some sort of active trace on them. They've, they've got to have an active, uh, active sensor track on the Duncan. There seems to be a um, a marked decrease in the amount of SAMs coming out of the Crimean Peninsula. Yeah, I spoke too soon. There's certainly less. There's still some, but certainly less. Good. So we'll see how much that t land strike will soften things up. We've got about another 50 minutes to run for the stream. Uh, we're going to have to stick to the strict three-hour time limit uh, for this stream. So I might actually just increase time compression a little bit up. So far. I believe we've run the entire stream so far in um, in one to one real time. I might just increase things a little bit. I think fair to say though, there's been a lot going on in uh, in this in this stream. The last two have been primarily, I think, me setting up missions and getting ready to sort of fly. But uh, there's been a lot of action here. It's been pretty much nonstop. Duncan Sea Whiz operator needs a medal. Uh, I think that's saved them like three or four times now. Ah, uh, not operator. Sea Whiz is actually um, is autonomous, so it will operate itself. Uh, what I mean is a Sea Whiz maintainer, which is usually a specialised role on board the ship. There'll be an electronics technician that's basically des designated to look after it. So that that guy deserves a medal. He's been doing a very good job. <laughs> So 
So I'm just looking for some strike aircraft to send after these, uh, these patrol craft here. Oh, that will do perfectly. I am Mavericks. Yeah, the order is updated. This doesn't seem to be any more uh, weapons coming in towards Duncan, so hopefully the group up here has expended all their ammunition and Duncan can make a hasty getaway. Uh, 28 knots on a slant towards 25. Excuse me, I'm just about to cough. Um, they're probably not going to be able to escape the attention of this surface group here. I would imagine this surface group is just chock full of surface to air missiles, so you know, launching any kind of strike against it at the moment is probably not going to be all that useful. We'll just have to see what happens. So it's pretty, um, it's pretty interesting the stories that sort of come out of uh, command. In, in, you know, like when we started this scenario, we obviously had no idea that HMS Duncan's uh, Sea Witch was going to be such a, a star performer and do so well. Um, this, the actually one of the sorry, the author of um, of this scenario, Gunner ninety eight, in conjunction with um, with another another community member, uh, Airborne Rifles, are, are actually writing a, a novel and series of novels based on command and the scenario that's played out with command. So it's really interesting to see how the narrative can unfold uh, in game and then be translated into, into a really interesting story. Um, I believe that uh, Tom Clancy also did something similar with um, Larry Bond when he was writing uh, Red Storm Rising. They, uh, they gamed out a lot of the, um, the battles there before writing it there, before writing a narrative to fit. I actually, I actually did a similar thing myself. I wrote a, um, I wrote an after action report for um, a submarine mission that I played uh, based on, I think it was Ivy Bells, uh, Operation Ivy Bells in the probably a late eighties. It would have been based the scenario. Um, I lost the submarine, got sunk, but it was still really, um, it was a still really a good way of, uh, of sort of finding a narrative for the story that I wrote. Uh, which you know ended in that submarine being sunk and everyone dying, but uh, nonetheless, the um, the events of this the scenario gave me good sort of story points to to weave into that after action report. Okay, just gonna speed up time a little bit while waiting for these cruise missiles to start impacting. Okay, 
So the um, the F-16s we launched with Maverick loadouts are headed towards their target, the patrol craft there. Just thinking about getting that uh, group of aircraft into uh, coverage a little bit earlier, maybe cutting that corner. shooting 20 minutes before they shoot so even if we run in real time uh, the whole time we are still going to get to see the b-52s launch their missiles yeah should be around the same time for them and these guys will be a bit later here okay cool our b2 i'm gonna change their doctrine Remember that I set uh, Doctrine for the entire side before to not use refueling. What I'm quickly going to do now is just go and change that for the tanker missions. So doing it this way just means that I have a lot more control over who refuels and who doesn't. Otherwise, when aircraft get to their, um, their refueling threshold, they'll just duck off and refuel, which is great for big scenarios where you know you can't really keep an eye on everything but and, you, and you're doing lots of long-range fighting but in this scenario it's big but uh, I want to be able to control precisely who uses um, the air-to-air air -air refueling So we're gonna assign them to refuel. You can refuel over over to uh, Romania. Yes, fantastic. Box D, I'll just make sure. Okay, cool. That's all gonna happen automatically. So once they've done that, their loiter point is gonna be there, uh, and they'll continue on to that loiter point after they refuel. I was hoping that these guys would run out of ammo, but it appears that is not the case. On the, uh, you can wait a second. On the plus side, it appears that they've run out of those uh, really, really fast missiles, and they're using something that's slower. Unless this is the same thing, and it just speeds up. Well, these are listed as vampires, and before it was guided weapon, so. 530 knots is much more your average cruise missile speed. Still streaming a beeline of Tomahawk missiles into the southern point of the Crimean Peninsula. We probably could have gotten a, uh, a high hit rate by spreading them out a little bit, but considering there's 200 of them and uh, I'm streaming live, I'm, I'm not really willing to sit down and replot them individually. Um, so just coming in over the Black Sea and then and avoiding the surface group here and then attacking their targets is fine for the purpose of the stream. So strike-wise, and, and really air yeah, combat-wise, the um, F-16s out of Turkey have been doing a lot of the heavy lifting. I think we identified in the briefing that was probably going to be the case. Um, let's see what we've got 
go. Okay, so these guys are almost ready to turn around. Oh no, they did, just landed, okay. The Raptors have STBs. STBs are pretty cool um, in that. Okay, the options are pretty limited there. Yeah, let's load them up with penetrators. I'm wondering if there's much of a difference between the way that I, I know that uh, the effect on a hardened target is much more significant using a BLU 109. I'm just wondering if the BLU 109 has uh, degraded performance against non hardened targets. So I guess we'll find out if we get to use them. Uh, so the STB is really cool um, in that it has a longer range. It has a, a much weaker warhead, so I'm not sure how well it's going to go attacking. Uh, actual military targets because I think it's just mainly designed to attack sort of um, asymmetric threats, you know, that we've seen in the last 20 years or so. But uh, those combined with the F-22's low observability and super crews, um, that could be some pretty significant strike assets there. Ah uh, yeah, new hazard. Yeah, there's um, I think there's plenty of loadouts there. It's more that I'm really constrained by what ammunition is available. Oh, okay, yes, yeah, so there's not not that many loadouts, but uh, what's really limiting me is uh, the fact that we haven't got any AMRAMs uh, available at that base. So let's have a look at the magazines. Yeah, that's the main. Main issue is that we're short of air to air missiles. Poor Duncan. Duncan's just really copped it. <laughs> they've uh, they've done extremely well for themselves, but they've just been on a sustained attack for probably the last 45 minutes. And I think they've fended off around and oh God, God knows how many missiles. So it's interesting to see that uh, while there's missiles inbound, the majority of them are not being engaged by aircraft, they're being engaged by surface-to-air missiles. So it's primarily surface-to-air missiles that are doing uh, the defensive work. They're not launching fighters to intercept or anything like that. Uh, so the long-term game plan here is to essentially, uh, first of all, protect our, um, our assets in the, the Black Sea, contest the airspace of the Black Sea, which I think we've done pretty effectively. Uh, at the start of the, this stream, there was, uh, there was a um, pretty heavy enemy air presence. Uh, we've taken care of that, although... This here is going to be an issue. These are bombers coming in. So I'm just going to launch some uh, some interceptors to attack these bombers because that's that's quite concerning. But uh, essentially, long story short, the um, the plan is to reduce the air threat over the Black Sea, uh, reduce air defences on the Crimean Peninsula, and then start striking uh, Russian targets in the Crimean Peninsula. Hmm, that's pretty cool, the uh, echelon formation. I wonder if Gunner did that on purpose.
Mm, so Newhouser says I shouldn't be flying over Moldova. Yeah, technically they're they're just outside. We can get an angry letter from the from the Moldovans later on. They can send us a, a nasty gram saying don't fly over us. But at the moment we've got a um, what looks to be a bombing raid inbound. Uh, so I've just launched some interceptors out of uh, Merzafon. I've also vectored a, um, a group of F-16s who were returning to base to intercept. Oh, actually, they were headed to refuel. Here's a great use for uh, our recon pod equipped aircraft. You can go and uh, see what these are. Not that I expect the recon pod to do much there. It's not going to be very effective against air, air aircraft, but uh, the pilot's still got eyes. So it carries a uh, DB-110 recon pod. Yeah, so it doesn't have air-to-air -air capability. I wonder if we're getting any decent hits in on the uh, on the right. Side. Okay, yeah, so we are on ammo pad, that's good. TLMs are finding their targets. So far not a huge amount of them, but that's fine. Okay, so yeah, we've, uh, we've actually done a fair bit of damage to this base. Um, the runway, that's good news that we're hitting the runway. Um, even if we can put that out of action for a couple of hours, that will allow us a bit more freedom in what we do, especially if it's host to fighter aircraft. Don't really know what's based where when it comes to the Russian, um, Russian forces. So I was considering taking uh, Duncan off automatic evasion, but I think one of the reasons that they're uh, that they're um, I can't think of words that their sea wizard has been so effective is because they're engaging defensive automatically, which is uncaging their um, their sea wizard to fight. I think often when when I leave uh, ships on a manual course when they're defending, their um, their sea wizard is probably not being uncaged. The uh, 
the arc is not being exposed to the incoming missile. See if we can engage some of these missiles with sidewinders. So aircraft are just descending to engage. Because uh, okay, yep, there we go. Because these weapons are a lot slower than the last ones we were engaging, we can actually engage in a tail chase here and still catch up to them, which is great. Because before, as soon as they got past our um, firing envelope, they uh, they were gone. Okay, our interceptors are up out of the uh, another phone. Afterburner. Getting some BDA updates from our uh, attack bombs, which is really cool. So they're actually feeding back um, information back to their, their firing vessel. So I'm actually going to use these aircraft here to engage with guns. Um, and these were the, the slammer firing aircraft. So I mentioned before that I was going to keep them around to, to help defend Duncan, which is exactly what they're doing. They've already vastly reduced the, um, the threat that's incoming. So we're down to three incoming uh, anti-ship missiles. So they're engaging with guns now. Hopefully these aircraft are inbound to attack something over here because we are starting to run out of um, self-defense assets around. I have vessels in the Black Sea. You know, Duncan can start getting some of their own back. Maybe was that uh, SSB that uh, identified them in the first place. So that, I mean, it's really the only thing that's in high point range at the moment. I could fire it again uh, at the Russian surface group up here, but it's not going to do any good. Whereas the SSB, these two half moons I've just fired off will probably actually sink, sink that. Turkish F-16 is doing a fantastic job of protecting Duncan. Uh, between the F-16s and R2-D2, I think they've probably cleared up 40-odd missiles.
I'm just gonna hide the reference points just so you can it. Oh cool, they've cleared up all the rest of those uh, guided weapons with guns. Let's see if they can do this last one. Hopefully I can take a little bit of pressure off R2. <laughs> um, mm, they're starting to run out of ammo on the... Well, I wonder if they may have reloaded. Okay, uh, so there's one particular phalanx that has fired three times, and I think it's probably three for three. The other one hasn't fired at all. Let's see which one it is. It's left or right. Down select. Not left, port, port. <laughs> So it's going to use, uh, not be shy with using the Amrams here to defend Duncan. So we've got a, a raid inbound here. We've got uh, interceptors vectored towards them. Hmm. Interceptors who are probably going to run out of fuel before they do anything useful. We've got some interceptors here that have just launched. Uh, they're probably going to get in contact. With us. We've also got the recon pod. Uh, carrying aircraft, which was RTB, after identifying uh, these surface vessels here, they're going to go check out and see if we can get an ID on these uh, aircraft to see if we can maybe identify the threat. Fantastic! So we've uh, saved Duncan's bacon once again. The uh, Turkish F-16s definitely owed a beer by the crew of the Duncan. See how our strikes are going in terms of uh, losses incurred to the enemy. Yeah, I think we might be destroying a fair a fair few uh, aircraft on the ground with our strikes against the, um, the airport there. So there was a lot of a lot of uh, impacts on hardened aircraft shelters and uh, parking lots. So they won't necessarily be destroyed, but due to spool damage and uh, and fragmentation and so on, the um, the aircraft that are hosted there will be destroyed. So this is uh, this is good. That's exactly what I want. There's a few ways to go about um, taking out an airbase or you know uh, attacking an airbase. My personal preference is to go after the aircraft. Um, if you get the munitions, you know they whatever's still loaded on the aircraft can still take off and be used against you, but they can't reload afterwards. If you get the fuel, uh, then that's not really modeled in most scenarios. Um, if you get the runway access points, the runways they can't take off, but that can be repaired. But if you get the aircraft, then they're destroyed. They're, they're gone. They're not going to be a threat. They're gone. Uh, you don't need to worry about them anymore. There's, there's no repairing them. There's no reloading them. They, are, they no longer exist. So my preferred way is to go after the aircraft themselves.
it's a um, apt name for that aircraft, Raider 11. I think they're going to investigate a raid. Harpoons closing in on a uh, SSV. It's already struck by uh, Mavericks earlier on. Uh, crippled, I would say, but just a target of opportunity and probably a little bit of revenge from Duncan, considering that it is probably this, this SSV that identified Duncan. Let's do the same thing here. I don't know, maybe not. Perhaps it's this vessel. Stikes. Okay. Sticks. Stikes. Yes, this uh, definitely could be a TU-22 raid. Um, that's what concerns me so much about it. Not quite sure what they are attacking. Uh, although I know that this fighter is coming down to meet this aircraft here. So I'm not quite sure what their target is. Um, you know, it's, it's something this way. <laughs> uh, so x just made the very good suggestion that um, some of the tier lands have probably had their targets destroyed and I should retarget them. If I wasn't streaming, I would probably do that, but it's going to be a, um, a fairly time intensive and not very interesting task to watch. So I'm just going to let it slide for the purpose of the stream. But that is, that is a really good suggestion though, to retarget the tomahawks that um, may have had their targets destroyed. There's, uh, there was 200 odd of them. So <laughs> there's probably like 50 left. And for me to individually check the targets of all 50 uh, would take a while and not be very interesting to watch. And unfortunately, we've only got 15 minutes left of the stream left. So I'm just accelerating time a little bit so we can find out what this raid is. And I think the conclusion of the TLAM strike and probably the interception of this raid is going to be the um around the time we wrap things up for today's stream which will be the, the final stream for 2018. That uh, airbase is really Sevastopol International Airport. So they're taking pretty extensive damage there. And that's good, good for us. Not so much for them, but it's good for us. Yeah, I think we destroyed a lot of aircraft on the ground, which is great news. Destroying aircraft on the ground is the best place to get them because they are totally defenseless. NCTR. I doubt it. And late 80s technology, probably not. So I was just uh, considering whether this F 16 might have non cooperative target recognition technology on its radar, which would allow us to identify uh, the aircraft simply by pointing our radar at them and getting a, um, an image back. That's not the case.
So these guys, I'm a little bit concerned about them going bingo before they get into combat. However, once they unload their AM rams, they're going to be a lot lighter and their range will be extended. So they should be able to get on, no problem. And we can also, uh, you know what, let's actually just do that now. So we're going to select a new home base of this airport, which is going to give them a lot more range to connect. So if they do go and land there, they're not going to be able to re, um, rearm, but uh, it means that we'll have more effective range here. So I haven't opened fire on these aircraft yet. I mean, it is pretty, pretty certain that they are hostile, but I'm still pretty loath to just fire on air contacts because they're there. I like to identify them first. Um, our harpoons have struck the SSV. That's too far away to be retargeted. So Duncan got its own back on that uh, on that spy ship that probably identified it and led to all of those missile raids. For a change, the Duncan isn't under direct threat from any um, any. Let's see if we can get the Duncan somewhere safe. So I'm just sending Duncan to the nearest naval base. I'm going to send him there at flank speed, uh, which has got more than enough fuel to do. They should be there in two hours, close to there in two hours. Um, meanwhile, I think we can keep up a decent cap for them a combat air patrol nearby. Uh, at the risk of speaking too early, it looks like Duncan's crew may yet get home. So got missiles incoming. Slot back, I think it's flanker, yeah. Uh, probably more valuable to shoot down the, uh, the bombers. Okay, so they're bears. Far, far less concerning than TU-22s. Um, if this aircraft gets home, they'll be lucky. I am going to... I de, um, deselected their targets by pressing Control e then. I'm actually going to allocate one AMRAM to this flanker. Uh, just to give them a bit of a fighting chance to get home. But I'd say the chances of them... The pilot of that aircraft returning to base are uh, slim. Oh, that's a nice pun there, Turkey shoot. <laughs> Turkish Air Force. So, we are probably... Okay, all, all of their weapons are really, really long range. and slow which is good what is 1600 nautical miles away or more huh it strikes me not as odd but it just seems it seems relevant that there is a, um, a JHQ modelled in this scenario. I wonder whether these aircraft are going to attack that target. 
If they do, I mean, that would be a huge escalation in this conflict. Uh, Raider 11 is headed home. Probably not going to get there though. <laughs> like the sticks missiles from uh, the Mare SSD frigate have uh, hit home and destroyed the other SSV. So that, that slot, that, um, that flanker is descending to engage probably with infrared missiles. Really the only hope that Raider 11 has is if this flanker is out of radar guided missiles, so long range anti-air missiles, and goes bingo shortly. If that doesn't happen, then, um, then they're just going to have to rely on missile dodging skills and probably run out of, out of fuel. I'm going to rebase them to uh, that diversionary airport as well. Uh, so JHQ is just, it just means joint headquarters, um, but the, the reason I say that it's interesting that's modelled is that, uh, that that could be there just for flavour, but I worry that it's a target for the uh, bear raid that's coming in here. The reason I say that is the bears have a um, their loadout weapons have a range of sixteen hundred odd nautical miles, which means that they're well and truly in range of anything around here. So. I'm just worried that seeing as they're flying out into the Black Sea to do their raid, what is their target? It's not any of the airfields, because all the airfields are single unit airfields. Raider 11 might make it home yet. I'm going to take them off automatic evasion. I think their best, their best bet is just to fly for home, fly as fast as possible towards home. Another aircraft, uh, another unit, sorry, that has performed uh, well above what we expected. Uh, they took out two uh, bears, or at least hit two bears. Did they destroy them? Yeah, they did. Uh, so they destroyed two bomber aircraft, um, have dodged a whole bunch of missiles, identified all these ships and now are uh, fleeing, running for home. It looks like our uh, flanker has run out of, um, I wonder if it's run out of fuel or if it's just uh, gone bink on Winchester. But either way, it looks like they're disengaging. So Raider 11, there's another, another story that's come out of, out of this scenario. Still gonna keep them at afternoon though. They can run for home. Okay, so we're in our last five minutes of uh, of our stream time. So I'm just gonna accelerate time, and the culmination of the stream is gonna be our attack on uh, on this inbound strike. Uh, the tomahawks, T lambs, um, are seeming to be. Landing almost unopposed now when it comes to surface to air missile threat, so that's a really good sign. Um, when we pick up the, the scenario on our uh, next um, on our next stream in the new year, uh, it'll be very 
interesting to see that the follow-up strikes, which are going to be coming from the, uh, the, the bombing aircraft, like the B-52s, the B-1s, and possibly the B-2 as well. Okay, so we are now in range with our interceptors loaded with AMRAMs. Still a little bit concerned about this flanker here, but not nearly as much as before. With with AMRAMs against less capable aircraft, oh sorry, more capable aircraft, um, I would probably wait to get a little bit closer, but considering that these are bombers, they are not very maneuverable. Um, they're certainly not gonna be, you know, turning and putting their afterburner on. There's also precisely eight of them, which is how many, uh, scratch that, still waking up. Is four too many? Four is too many. Oh no, wrong one. <laughs> no, two, two is about right. Because I remember as well, we've got aim nines. Talking to myself here, but I'm just thinking like, you know, am I allocating too many uh, weapons against these aircraft? But no, um, it's important that we destroy them. They've got really long range weapons, so they might launch at any moment. Um, it's important that we destroy them as soon as possible. So I've just got 14 seconds to go before they can fire. I've got two minutes to go left in the stream. So we might go, I don't know, four or five minutes over time, but not half an hour like last time. Jam. So hopefully, uh, where are these vampires coming from? Vampires. Poor Duncan. <laughs> Poor Duncan. At least they've got decent air cover this time. So these aircraft have automatically gone uh, Winchester return to base. I'm just going to unassign them. And they can go after the bombers up here. I'll just automatically assign them there. They'll use their sidewinders. And then uh, following that, they can mop up whatever's left. Also, I'm just going to give them a bit of mid-course guidance for their missiles. Okay, so we'll just wait till these missiles impact and then we are going to follow up uh, in the new year with the, the pursuit and hopeful engagement with uh, Sidewinders, followed by these F-16s here. Good effect on target so far. Uh, we can see the AMRAMs have uh, re-targeted. Probably overkill. Yeah, it was overkill. Oh. Are they going to re-target? No, they're not. Okay, so we're going to wrap up the uh, the stream there. Thanks so much for joining me once again. Um, we will continue with our oh wow, <laughs> there's going to be a lot going on next time. So we will continue with this uh, with this playthrough um, in the new year. Uh, thank you once again for joining me. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the stream, and I look forward to streaming again with you in 2019. Thanks very much. <laughs>